Don't, don't fall off there, Tony. That'll uh, make for a good panel. <laughs> <laughs> entertaining, if nothing right. else. Good morning. Thank, thanks, everyone, so much for joining us here. We're, we're thrilled to have Client Entertainment Analytics, the competitive advantage through the eyes of industry leaders, presented by Ticket Manager. Uh, on this panel, we have Tony Knopf, the CEO and co-founder of Ticket Manager. Uh, we have Deb Curtis here from American Express, Jim Van Stone from Monumental Sports, and Alan Rabb from Coca-Cola. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. Thank you. Hi. Uh, as introduced, I'm Tony Knopf. I am uh, CEO of Ticket Manager. My job today is to get out of the way. Uh, I want to be up here to present to you guys some of the insights that we see from some industry moguls and maybe a little different approach to what happens with sponsorship and analytics around live events. So to set the table a little bit, companies globally spend about $600 billion a year on live entertainment, live events, sports tickets, that sort of thing. And they do so with a lot of different goals in mind and a lot of different quantifiability that they use. So our goal today is to look behind the curtains on that. It's to see what large businesses do, how they make those decisions, and what kind of data they use to do that, and how that data is used as we move forward into the landscape. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give a quick introduction to our panel here. I'm going to walk through a quick bio for each one. We're going to start with Deborah Curtis. Deborah is with American Express. You guys have probably heard of it, one of the largest global brands there is. She is the Vice President and Head of Global Experiential Marketing and Partnerships, where she leads the company's strategic marketing alliances, engagement platforms, and experiential events in sports, fashion, film, music, and theater. That's a lot. She's responsible for leading premier partnerships with Live Nation Entertainment, AEG, The Bowery Presents, Made Fashion Week, USTA, USGA, and the NBA, as well as with many NBA teams individually. Through her music programs, including American Express Unstaged, Deborah was recently named the top woman in music by Billboard for the third consecutive year. She's also distinguished as one of the 2015 50 Forward Accomplished Alumni from the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University. So that's Deb. Uh, Jim Van Stone, uh, joining to our right here. He is currently the President of Business Operations and Chief Commercial Officer for Monumental Sports and Entertainment, where Jim oversees ticket sales and service, corporate partnerships, executive suites, marketing and retail business. Previously, he was MSC's chief revenue officer, where he oversaw ticket sales and services, executive suites, and corporate partnerships. Prior to MSC, he had senior executive positions with the Coyotes, with Comcast Spectacor, with both the Flyers and the Sixers, and with the Cavaliers. And so that's Jim. Thanks, Tony. And finally, we have Alan Rabb. Alan is financial leadership for USA operations at Coca-Cola which includes all business activities related to bottled or delivered beverages in the U.S. This includes brand strategy, marketing, and integrated content for all sparkling and still brands, national retail sales, franchise and commercial leadership, productivity and marketing, procurement for CCNA business affairs, and contract negotiations. So he's got a lot on his plate, a bit. to say the least. A bit. Thank you, Tony. So let's get started. You know, it's really noisy out there, guys. Uh, the airwaves, our apps, Everybody wants our attention, right? Whether they're trying to get it for the brand or whether the Monumental is trying to help the brands leverage that. So, what I want to ask first, I'm going to start with Deborah and Jim. You know, large companies make decisions based on mountains of data, a lot more data than people believe. These are quantifiable decisions. Given that fact, there's clearly a benefit to live events, right? There's a reason people are doing this. What's the main driver in your decision at American Express? And then for you with your customers, yep to engage in live events and assets. You know, what's driving that? And then when they make decision, how do they quantify it? Sure, so really when we think about live events, I actually have to give some perspective more broadly about the company and our overall strategy, both as a brand and a business. And a lot of people may or may not be surprised that we're over 165 year old company. We didn't start as a card company, we started as a freight forwarding business. And really the through line for the over 165 years has actually been we are a brand that's been about service. And service for our customers, whether it's in freight forwarding, travel, or payments. Um, so really we actually look at live events and experiences as a three-dimensional manifestation of that service proposition. Um, and so everything that we do are, is in service of our customers and we use live events to really drive that. So really, the analytics behind that is where are our customers? What do they love? What do they have passion for? 
What did they spend on? Um, and we start there, and that's where we really make decisions about who we have as partners, how we deliver the experience for them, and really anything is guided around delivering, again, are we delivering a true service for our customers? And that's, that's really how we got into the live event space and how we make all of our decisions um, around our portfolio of partners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Jim, you see that a lot mm -hmm. with a lot of different businesses yep. who have different goals, but it seems that the quantifiability has become even more important as we've moved forward. They use data, they make decisions based on different things that you offer. How has that landscape changed at Monumental over the last 15 years? Uh, I would say it's absolutely tremendous. I mean, the analytics uh, drive, I, I think, is as a whole from our organization. I think we started a couple years back with having two dedicated people in analytics. I think right now we're over 14. You know, so we're really being uh, tasked from our partners and our clients to make sure that we're keeping up with the trends. I think making sure that we have quantifiable data uh, that allows them to really, uh, you know, be able to evaluate a, a true return on investment. The one thing I will say about live entertainment, though, you know, we, we are in the memories business. You know, we believe and we, we educate our staff that every time a customer comes down here or we partner with a brand, you know, we've got a responsibility to create a Hall of Fame moment for them. And, you know, there's nothing better than being there in the middle of a live action standpoint. It's funny, the other day I helped a, a client get tickets for uh, a partner that they were working with in, in L.A. It was the Capitals versus the Kings. Well, all of a sudden, I'm watching on TV. The Caps are down 3 nothing after the first period. I'm like, oh, God, this guy's going to wring my neck. You know, next thing you know, it's an even played second period. And then the third period, the Caps scored three goals. And we had a, an unbelievable, you know, game. Unfortunately, we didn't finish out the way we wanted to. But the customer called me the very next day and said, man, you made me look like a rock star in front of my client. The value of that client means a tremendous amount to my company. So, you know, that relationship and that connection and the, the, the personal access, I, I think, is, is key for a lot of folks. And I think for us, you know, we need data to be, basically be able to analyze what's working and what's not, and then work with our partners to make sure that we've got the right packaging for them. Absolutely. So, Alan, I want to move a little bit on to that. You know, Coke is one of the best known global brands. There's no doubt about that. And as such, you guys have a different level of scrutiny internally and externally on marketing, sales, engagement, and employee programs, more than most will understand, especially in this room. And so offering some light into that would be helpful. Yet you have one of the most successful and well-known programs in the world. How do you navigate the scrutiny so successfully with such a global reach? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, can you hear me? I didn't Absolutely. Know, the I mic, can hear you is the mic on? Um, I'll tell you, the, the, the really cool thing about we just announced a new structure in January. The cool thing about the structure we've got now is that everything for us emanates from our brand, as you would expect. It's no different than um, American Express or any other brand in the, in the industry. So emanate, everything emanates from our brands, and we need to make sure it adds the ultimate value that it can to our consumers and our customers. So if you start with those two core tenets, everything else needs to surround and protect that and help, help invest in that. So the cool structure that we just rolled out now is underneath the USA operations, where I have the fortune of working, We've got the brand organization from all of our sparkling brands and our spill brands, every brand in the portfolio. And we have a clear strategy of what we want to do in order to make sure that those brands can reach our consumers and our customers lives in order to make those good special moments for them. Also in USA operations, we've got our franchise system. So we are a franchise system by definition. We have about seven, 65 to 70 bottlers uh, in, the, in the United States. So we have to execute everything through bottlers. So that just because the Coca-Cola company wants to do it doesn't mean it gets done. It's got to actually work with our franchise system. Also, we've got inside of USA Operations a customer system as well. So we've got a whole organization that does nothing but call on customers, whether it's Target or Walmart or American Express or anybody. We've got a whole organization that calls on customers. And so making sure that you've got the connections between the brand strategy, how you actually refresh your consumers and customers through our franchise system and our customers, and then where we come in from an analytics standpoint in the area that I work in is I've got a business affairs organization that helps negotiate all of those deals. So, for example, if we want to go negotiate a deal with AMC movie theaters or NASCAR or Taylor Swift or a, a professional sports team, the Falcons or the Braves are both building new stadiums in my hometown and renegotiating deals with those, the business affairs team is the common link to make sure that we understand what's important to consumers, customers, brands, our franchise bottlers, and then how we actually execute in the marketplace. And so um, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it's... It sounds a lot more complex than I think it really is because we've got some pretty well-established processes. But for us, em everything emanates from the brand strategy. And then what is it going to actually do? What are we going to do in, in order to enhance a consumer and a customer's experience? 
So that's important. So I'll follow along with that with a question for, for all three in a different way. You know, I think it's safe to say, Jim, that the days of let's find Alan and take him to, you know, dinner and get him a batting practice are over. Yeah. Um, what does that look like for you guys when you're trying to engage a new brand? Mm -hmm. And then for Alan, you know, we joked around backstage that you have Harvard MBAs paying bills. <laughs> what does that look like on the quantifiable side for you when you're dealing with some of the sports franchises that don't have 14 people in data? Jim, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, like anything, I mean, the, the data is important, but I think it's also, we have to sit down with our clients and really clearly understand mm -hmm. what their objectives and strategies are. You know, we have access to a lot of different, I think, you know, experiential points and, you know, what might be important for one may not be as important for others. So, you know, case in point with, with American Express, and they've been a great partner of ours, you know, we, we've really, I think, from an NBA and NHL standpoint, you know, have adapted to their membership has its privileges program. So, you know, we actually have all created memberships. I think in DC, we've got the Caps 365, we have the DC 12 Club, we have Mystics 52. And what we figured out was by seeing what programs like American Express has created with their loyalty platforms is that we need to make sure that we're, you know, providing our customers with, you know, experiences that truly match what they're looking for. And I think that drives retention, that drives, you know, connections with your brands, it, it, it drives, you know, hopefully at the end of the day, revenue results. You know, so one of the programs that we did with American Express uh, through this loyalty program, and we have 100,000 members, is that we do a, an incentive after surveying people and finding out what they want, whether it's autographed merchandise, experiential opportunities, and figure out what programs really resonate with them. And American Express has been a great partner of ours in terms of driving people to pay for their, their season tickets on an American Express card. And you know, making sure that you clearly understand what, what a brand's objectives and strategies are is, is critical, but then also aligning with what makes the end user really, uh, you know, I, I think resonate the most in terms of you know, buying or, 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 or believing in the product. And so what does that look like on your end? Yeah, for us, it's, um, so let's, let's take the, uh, the channel of colleges and universities. So colleges and universities are important to all of us. It's where all of our children go eventually one day. I've got two in college now. It's expensive, by the way. <laughs> and so what we do is we actually evaluate things by market. So if we've got a market, pick Minneapolis. If I've got Minneapolis, inside of Minneapolis, I've got um, the Vikings and the Timberwolves and the Wild, and I've got the University of Minnesota. I've got a number of different things inside of that market. And I look inside that market and make sure that when I invest my dollars, I'm doing it for the highest and best leverage return on my investment. Okay, I also look at productivity and efficiency, and what can I do to partner with customers in that marketplace again, to enhance my brand experience in that market. So inside the college university system, inside of the college channel for us, we've got measures and we rank colleges. We actually look at analytics by college. We look at investment per student inside of our colleges. And we look at the type of value that we can actually put on that college campus for the college, for the, for the kids that are going to the college and for us as well. And so we break that down for every one of our channels. So although we've got, as I use the quintessential Harvard MBA paying bills, all of our people have a role in actually analyzing what does something to return productivity, investment, and efficiency back to our organization and our partners that we work with. So, so batting practices are nice, but it's not why you're doing deals. Yeah, don't invite yeah. me to a batting <laughs> practice. So. All right, so Deborah, we'll move to you. Um, Deloitte released their 2016 report stating that companies are looking for experiences more than tickets. You know this better than anybody. You guys set the standard when it comes to experiences and how that separates your brand from others and what you're looking to achieve. So what is it that you look for in an experience? What really separates what an offering is for you that makes you want to be a part of it? Um, I guess, you know, in a lot of cases, again, it's, it's where does the role of American Express come in? And we often, and when we talk to our partners, we talk about, well, we don't want to do it unless there's a heroic role for a brand. Because again, if we're not coming back to that service proposition, for us, it's not putting our name up. Everybody knows our name. Um, global, universally known um, names, so we love our logo, but that's not our priority. Our priority, again, is to deliver that val value back to the customer. Right. Um, so for us, experience is everything. Um, we've certainly had a very extensive, we were, we've, we've, we're a pioneer in the pre-sale ticket, you know, early on sale um, ticket space, and it's a wonderful uh, value and benefit for our customers. But so much of that is about how do you take that tangible value. The real memory making happens in that moment. And so for us, it's so important to link back to create yeah. being part of that memory. 
um, and to have a very clear service role for our brand. Um, and so that's really how we look at every, the importance of experiences when you talk about it going beyond the ticket, absolutely. And again, it really has to be clearly linked back to, to our brand delivering that value. So how do you stay ahead of that, Jim? Uh, I think we have to work in, in, in unison. I, I think we have to capture that moment. You know, when someone comes down, one of the great programs we do with Amex is that you have the opportunity to come down and say courtside for an NBA game, but then you also have the opportunity to be part of the captain's huddle. And there's nothing like being a, being a consumer and bringing a, a father and son or a, a mother and daughter out to center court with the two team captains there and the referees going through the pregame instructions. To capture that moment, whether it's on video or photo, that builds the connection between Amex and our team locally. Mm -hmm. And that hopefully resonates with the partners or the clients that we're trying to both target in, in our community. So, you know, I think as brands, we have a responsibility when we create these unique experiential opportunities, whether it's access, whether it's uh, an emotional connection, to make sure that we're capturing it and then sharing it with everyone else because there's the uniqueness of us partnering together that you have access to programs that you can't have any other way. And I just um, build on that because we're, I mean, this is a conference all about analytics. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we see is that when we do have that kind of depth of engagement with um, our customers, that leads to long-term long loyalty and, and actually more spend on our card, that they're thinking about using the American Express card more because it's been a part of their life yeah. mm -hmm. and those life mm -hmm. moments. And so there is a part of being able to track back to the, the real both intangible as well as truly tangible value of that kind yeah. of experience. And I was talking to an NBA team a few months ago who said that their recent uh, program with American Express has led to season ticket renewals on American Express mm -hmm. at a percentage that they didn't expect. Um, you know, most people think that they're going to see the little crowd banging sticks and that's the sort of thing that drives brand loyalty, but there's a lot of things that go on beyond, below, you know, behind the stage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, Alan, moving back to you, you guys have a world-class team in process. I mean. I think for you, what seems a little rudimentary is 501 in compliance, staff, team, organization for the rest of us in the room. So you've built a world-class team around entertainment assets, around how you procure things and the process around them. And I believe that brings a huge advantage to your business. What does that look like? How did you guys make the decision to do that? And then how have you iterated along the way to make it as successful as it's been? Yeah, and I, you know, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but this goes back to productivity and efficiency for right. me. It also goes back to know, know your role and know what you're good at. So back in 2001, uh, we went through an internal audit inside of our organization, and we determined that you know one of the ways we could ha actually help to enhance some of our control environment and improve our analytics was in the area of entertainment assets, tickets. Okay, and so at the time we had about 25,000 tickets that we knew about, and so we went out and we bid out through an RFP process uh, to go find a partner to be able to help us actually understand the insights in terms of how we could better leverage those tickets uh, with our consumers and our customers and our brands. Same thing I've, I've, I've said uh, the previous couple questions. And so we did that. Now here we are 15 years later, we've got over 500,000 tickets in this database. So we've, we've actually mined all that information into one place. And as a result of having that much data there, we realized that we're not the experts being able to manage that stuff. So we've got to be able to use partners like Ticket Manager, not a plug, but that's just, that's use a partner like Ticket Manager to be able to have yeah. to help us manage all of that data. Because if you can imagine, if you're gonna churn 500,000 tickets a year through a system, you've gotta have a, a world-class database and system to be able to do that. And then most importantly, you have to be able to capture the data so you can understand it, analyze it, and use yeah. it for the highest and best leverage use. So what we have inside of Ticket Manager, we have a priority order in terms of who gets tickets or um, uh, experiential events by event, so the NASCAR race that was in Atlanta a couple weeks ago, we made sure that the first thing that actually went in the decision criteria was customers. That's the first place that goes is customers. Consumers goes next, because a lot of our customers actually reach the consumers through the tickets that we give them, and if they haven't, then we go to the consumers next, and we actually have a request process for consumers. And then we move down the line. Personal request is at the very bottom of the list, that if there's excess inventory there, then what we do is we offer it to our associates for either personal request or for managers for reward and recognition. So the, the, the big thing with managing all of that data is understanding how are we using that data with customers to improve their experience with our brands and how are they using it with their consumers to enhance our brand experience with them. And so for us, a lot of it is, again, knowing what you're good at, and if you're not good at something, we're not good at managing ticket assets. That's not our core capability. 
uh, finding a partner who can do that at the most productive and efficient way possible. So to touch on that, Jim, are you seeing that move when it comes from your buyers? Now, uh, you know, we have American Express and Coca-Cola up here because they are trailblazers, yep. right? They're far ahead of everybody else. And I know that some smaller businesses don't have that ability. What are you guys doing beyond you know, ticket management and those sorts of things to show the ROI to the customer that comes in? Because I'm sure that's a, that's a concern sometimes, right? Yep. Somebody comes in, they buy a suite, that person leaves the company in the five year period and now you need to renew them. Yeah. What is it that you guys are pointing to as quantifiable data to show them that they're getting what they need out of MSC? It's a good question. I, I think uh, when you take a look at maybe some other areas outside of ticketing, you know, for example, TV visible signage, we all subscribe to Reputom, so you have a, a tangible you know, program in place. You know, for taking a lot of times, to be honest with you, there was never a tremendous amount of resources out there to really help, I think, properties help their clients manage tickets and programs. You know, believe it or not, I mean, wins and losses, you know, certainly affect a little bit peaks and valleys, but the biggest challenge we've always had at the end of the day, that if an investor doesn't use the tickets and they go to waste, they open their door and, and unused tickets are there, then they're probably not likely to renew. So I think from our standpoint, you know, as much as it's great to hear Alan and the way they analyze, I think from our standpoint, we also need resources as properties to be able to go out and say, hey, by tracking this, by understanding who's coming, by understanding what the value of that customer is that's using the tickets, how it's helping your new sales department generate new business for the company and stuff like that, we need those efforts. And that's where companies like yourself, uh, Tony, ticket manager, I, I think really come into play. So, you know, it, it's a two-sided, you know, I, I think opportunity. You know, we're using some of the data that, you know, your team's helping us with to make sure that we're going out to the right customers, you know, to, to, to see that, you know, they're getting the most out of their investments that they're having. If they get a lot of out of their investments, then for us, you know, they're going to come back. And, and to touch on something interesting, uh, you know, when I got offered my first job in sports 20 years ago, I was told sports is a tough business because you can't control your product, right? Yeah. Um, your teams are winning now, they're doing fantastic. There were some times when they weren't, you mm -hmm. know, a decade ago. How did you approach, what's the difference look like now when you're working with a brand like an American Express or like a Coca-Cola or another? What's the difference look like now that the teams are winning? How are you yeah. taking care of those partners? How are the packages changing? You know, I, I think from our standpoint, uh, you know, the data is really helping us. All the data through every resource that we're, we're looking at is really helping us make decisions, whether it's on pricing, whether it's on benefits, whether it's on programs. You know, I, I think it's all coming together. Uh, I can tell you probably 10, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I mean, we were in rooms kind of with gut instincts of saying we should do this or we should offer that or we should try this. And there was no quantifiable data mm -hmm. to give us educated decisions on that process. And now I think from our standpoint, you know, we're offering more programs, we're offering more price points. You know, when we take a look at our inventory as a whole, you know, I think 10 years ago, we were probably five or six season ticket price points. I think now we have 36 different price points. Mm -hmm. The, the, the data is telling us that people want certain areas, they want certain benefits to go with those programs, and I think technology. And years ago, technology. people would incorrectly assume that that was the wrong thing to do. Yeah. You need simple price points, but it seems that that hasn't been the case yeah. here. Yeah, I, you know, I, it, it's so funny, because one of the things, I mean, you know, not on the front lines every single day. Right. I feel for our sales reps, because honestly, when you have so many different programs, right. it's, you gotta make sure that you've got technology to make sure that they're communicating the right programs, but it, it really is making a difference. I mean, you know, so. Uh, and the good thing is that people in a lot of your shoes out there, you guys are going to be so much further ahead uh, than we were years ago and stuff like that and connected to the technology and, and, and the power of that. So, uh, Deborah, we're, we're all not one for hyperbole, but, you know, you, you, you sit in a very impressive role on American Express and do things that you are um, able to see things and do things that we all aspire to at some point in the near future. What, in that role, what's your focus for the near term? when it comes to live events. What are you looking at now, and what do you think is, is important in the very near term when it comes to the live event future for American Express? I mean, in the biggest sense of that, of focus is actually focus. I mean, it is very easy, and you talked about distractions of yeah. mounds of data. Something gets hot and right now. And something gets yeah. hot, and what's the latest technology, and we, you know, everyone get, gets excited about that, but I think my job and my role is to keep my team maniacally fo focused on the customer right. and figure out what that right solution is and A, not be chasing the next bright, shiny object or not be really looking in the rear, rear view windows or at the noise of competition, but really be looking at ourselves and what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. 
um, and really understanding the customer and understanding the property and our partnerships um, and what we can do to take that to the next level. And that's how we've, I mean, that's always been our winning formula mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. I think is just always gonna, that always really results in the best ideas for us. Um, and so my focus is focus, um, really. What's been one of the neat uh, ones you've done recently? Um, so one that you know we're really w turned out to be an incredibly proud moment. We partnered um, with Taylor Swift um, in her last tour. I think we, I've heard of her. She you know, might be the largest. <laughs> anyone yeah. you know not heard yeah. of her? Um, <laughs> and uh, we had actually been with her since her first tour. Mm -hmm. So you'd be surprised that you know we we kind of took a bet on her um, very very early. And so in the last year, in the last tour, we said um, with her team, you know, let's, let's do something really different together. Um, and we actually worked on a, what would I would consider sort of a virtual reality type three, 360 experience app. We actually won an Emmy for it this year. Um, but what I think was most proud is the kind of feedback that we got from people um, to me was, like just one of those incredibly proud moments because it wasn't innovation and technology for technology's sake. Um, I'm as proud of the radios we give at the US Open as I am about a, a virtual reality experience if it meets a customer need. Um, and for the rabid Taylor Swift fans, you can imagine we're very tech savvy and want to do anything to learn more about her. It was, it was a really fun um, part to be part of her journey and to bring that to millions of her fans and then bring our customers to her tour. So um, to me, that was a, was a great example over the year, but I think, you know, really there are many, many examples and it all goes back to knowing your customer. As is usually the case, you are mm -hmm. too humble about yeah. getting on board with Taylor Swift early <laughs> and then riding that train as she is the hottest thing going right now. Uh, Jim, what's your focus near term when it comes to live events with MSD? Wow, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that we are enamored with right now, and I think a lot of the brands that we talk to is, is that virtual reality experience. Mm -hmm. You know, having people feel that they are truly in an immersive experience. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about internally is, you know, the future, for example, of suites or season tickets and how can we sell our partners not only the you know events that we're hosting at the Verizon Center, but how can we take that show on the road? And if I'm buying seats on the glass for you know the, the capitals, you know, and I'm entertaining great clients, how can I take great clients to, you know, the Staples Center and mm -hmm. actually have them sit on the glass and experience a capitals game on the road. So, you know, the the immersive opportunities I think the virtual reality is going to create for us is something that you know, we are truly excited about. We, we've jumped on very, very quickly in terms of, you know, partnering with a, a couple different brands to really, you know, get people that behind the scenes experience. And I, I think that's what customers are looking for. They're looking for something different and unique and they want to be a part of it. And that's what connects them to sports properties or, you know, venues like ourselves that, that host 220 events a year. And for those that don't know, I mean, you guys have a tech background. Your we, we do, is yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, our owner is a tech pioneer, uh, Ted Leonsis, uh, one of the founders of AOL. So he's always pushing us, you know, to look at technology and how we can overall, you know, to Deb's point, improve the customer experience. So for example, we partner with a great company called uh, Experience, and our guests that sit in the 400 level through iBeacon technology, as soon as they take the escalator up to the 400 level, they immediately get pinged with an offer to potentially upgrade their seats to the club level or the 100 level. So, you know, looking at technology and what you can do to improve the overall you know, customer experience, I, I think is something that challenges all of us, whether you're, you're a brand or you're the property. So I like that we're getting a, a little bit of a change, right? We're getting a, a very different view of what's happening in the near future, both from the buyer side and then from the, from the building side. Alan, yours is also a different approach. What, what's the focus for you guys in the short term here? As you, you know, as we were talking about backstage, you guys acquired a bottling group and you've made some acquisitions in the last five years, which would be the size of acquiring five professional teams at one time. What's the short-term focus for Coca-Cola right now? You know, for, for uh, let me just go on, on Deb and Jim's back. What they said, ditto and ditto, right? It's, it's, <laughs> about, the, yep. it's about the consumer and customer experience. And, and what Deb described is almost identical to what I would tell you that way we approach things as well with people like Jim as well. Um, the Not chasing the shiny nickel or the, the fad of the moment, doing things that actually are sustainable for our brand and our customers and our consumers. In terms of the short term, is if you followed anything that we've done in the press, you see see that we're in a massive refranchising effort, not only in North, North America business, but also globally. 
And so from a short-term business perspective, we're actually making sure that we can, again, I'm going to say it again, we can do everything to drive as much productivity and efficiency into how we operate day in and day out. Our chairman's come out with a productivity goal for us for the next three, four years. It's $3 billion, not a small number. So everything we're doing is focusing on productivity, and that doesn't just sit in the marketing space uh, or in the finance space. It, it, it's in how we operate. So the refranchising effort, that's what that's all about is getting bottler territories so they're contiguous to one another to be able to increase the system productivity, the system profitability, and the system efficiency. So from a business perspective, we're focused on a lot of the refranchising efforts, efforts from a marketing perspective, ditto and ditto. It's exactly what they said. So. Absolutely. Well, uh, 30 minutes is far too short for you guys, Deb, Jim, Alan. I really appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, we have run out of time, so we're not going to be able to do questions, but I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you to our panel. It was a pleasure and an honor having you guys. Thank you. Thank you.